Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to episode 82. Can you believe it? We're on episode 82 of Talking Asperger's with Andrew. My name's Andrew Marsh, and I'm autistic. My representation of autism is Asperger's syndrome, or type 1 autism, which is the modern uh, description of narrative of that. I, I use the word Asperger's syndrome for me, because that's what feels better for me. And I work with employers to help them better manage people like me. Autistic people, people who have Asperger's syndrome in their business. And the way that I do this is by using my life experience. I, I was diagnosed eight years ago. I used to be a geologist before all the before I even knew I had Asperger's, although I've always known I was different. But before I had my diagnosis, I had a successful career as a geologist. Now looking back on it, I think, okay, you had Asperger's. These are the challenges you had at work. These were the situations where things didn't work for you particularly well. What would I do now with a clean slate? How would I manage someone like me? If someone like me walked into a business where I was an employer uh, and said, I'd like to work for you, you've got an advert, I have my CV, and we take them on, what would I like them to do to help me be good at my job? And that's what I do. I help employers manage better manage people with Asperger's syndrome in their businesses. And I have a weekly webinar and this is it. And today's topic is a, is a really good one because it's something that can get overlooked, particularly by what I would call the micromanagers, which we don't really support in when we talk about um, management in the 21st century. We're in the third decade of the 21st century. We should be looking at leaders who inspire. But just coming back to that, today's topic is about consistency. Simple as that. One word, consistency. But it's really important because a lot of autistic people, a lot of people who have Asperger's, like me, like things that are familiar. It's like a situation where we've got a job. We've been explained how to do the job. We've sat next to someone who's explained it to me. We've done a couple of dummy runs and, and seen that we've understood it. We've gone off on ourselves to do the job and they've checked up, us and up on us every now and then and said, you're doing great, fabulous, keep that up. That's how I learn. That's how a lot of autistic people and a lot of people with Asperger's learn. It's not by getting a 50-page manual and they said, yeah, it's in there, mate, sort yourself out. I like to sit down next to someone and say, can you show me how this works? Show me what you want to do. Tell me what you want to do. Show me what you want to do. Let me ask the questions. You can make the explanations. I can pick it up and then let me have a couple of dummy runs and see how I get on. That's exactly how I used to do it when I worked in construction as a geologist. I was on a, a very large motorway project during construction phase. It was a hundred million pound job around Manchester, the M60 around Manchester. And as part of the supervision of, of the works, and there's a lot of us, we had 60 plus staff supervising the works. We had um, a draftsman, a very skilled draftsman who was doing as built drawings as we went so that we didn't just have a pile of drawings to sort out at the end. We did them as we went. And if we had to make changes to the works, we would do it during the works. And if we needed to do drawings, we would go and see the draftsman and say, I want you to do this. That's the drawing it came off. I need to change that, change that, change that. And I would spend some of my time sitting next to him when he was making amendments to drawings because I wanted to understand what he did. Not necessarily so that I could repeat it, in that instance, but so that I could understand what he was doing and I could understand that next time when I had something that I needed doing, I would know it would take him half an hour or it would take him two hours or it would take him a day because of the level of change that needed to be made. And that was a really useful way for me to learn is to sit down next to the person who was skilled at it and teach me. Just like when we started using this thing that I'm talking to you on now, a computer. When I started work, no one had computers. No one. No one of the technical staff had computers. It did not exist in in the construction industry, in my world. When eventually we got into computers, I obviously didn't know how to use one. I didn't know how to how that there was this thing called Word, and I didn't know how to open a Word document. I didn't know how to type. So 
there was a particular occasion when I was working and I needed to do I needed to type something up um, and rather than give it to the typing pool do it by hand give it to the typing pool and it would come back three days later we didn't have time for that so my colleague my senior colleague said to me well there's the computer just sit down at that and type what you want and I looked at him and went what do you mean because I'd never used I'd never interfaced with the computer so I didn't know how to do it he said okay I'll, he showed me how to open up a word document so there I had this this virtual white screen with the with the virtual piece of paper on the screen and he said, just type type what you want to say and I'm going clunk 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 <laughs> like that and eventually after months of practice I became proficient at learning how to do that but that was because he sat next to me and showed me how to do it the number of times I have looked on in despair at people who have been instructing someone to do something and said oh it it's over there in the corner it's in that box in the corner over there you'll find what you want in there just go on and get on with it no that is not how you instruct someone to do any piece of work it's not how you guide them into how you want them to do a piece of work take the time that time that you invest at the beginning that quarter of an hour that one hour if it needs to be an hour wow a whole hour with a cup of tea in a meeting room where you're not interrupted by the phones and people in coming in and out if you can't afford to spend that hour with someone going through what you want them to do you shouldn't be a manager because your job as a manager i prefer to use the word leader is to support everyone in your team in the way that best works for them to be as productive as they can be that's your job your job isn't to stand there with a clipboard going you were a minute late coming back from lunch i'm going to write you up i'm going to dock you 15 minutes pay for that and you didn't come back from this at that time and you were late and you left early then and you have to go to the dentist and i'm you haven't caught up with the top stop that shouldn't have been how we did business in the 70s and 80s. It's certainly not how we should be doing business now in the third decade of the 21st century. We should be looking for leaders who inspire. And they do that by encouraging you, by showing you, by supporting you so that you can do your job. And that is part of being consistent. So that if you're a lot of a lot of jobs we do, let's let's give an example. Let's take an accountancy firm, for example. Now, although all the data is different that you get from a client, the process that you go through is the same. You're looking for overhead costs. So that's your premises, that's your uh, cars, that's your um, stationery, that's your rent and your heating and your lighting and your phone bill and your internet bill. That all comes under one umbrella. So you, you would have a spreadsheet that has all of those sorts of things that you would input the data. You would have other costs. So your direct costs, which would be your staff costs and staff expenses. They would come under something else. They would have You would have other on costs such as pension provisions and all of those sorts of things, superannuation and all those things. So you would be looking for those sorts of things in the data you get from client. So... An accountancy firm has the same type of process that they do every single client. They're looking for certain types of information to put into a certain spreadsheet to rationalize it all so that they will be able to, at the end of the day, when it all works out, you will have a profit and loss statement. You earned £1.2 million that year. You spent £900,000 to, to make that £1.2 million. Therefore, you had a profit of £300,000. Job is great. Company's doing well. Well done. What you don't want is company made £900,000 last year, took £900,000 in revenue last year, and it cost you £1.2 million to do it. You've just lost three hundred grand, So your company's not doing as well. But that, rep that repetition, that consistently, that doing the same sorts of thing over and over again is what they do in accountancy. It's how you set up your job with your team members, particularly those who are autistic or have Asperger's syndrome. We love consistency. Many of us love doing repetitive tasks. Some people hate doing, doing the same thing over and over again, but we 
have a tendency to enjoy that because when we're shown, sat down with, explained, had been able to ask questions, done a couple of dummy runs, etc., etc., when we're shown correctly how to do something, we're like an automaton. Wind us up, set us off, and off we go. Bang, boff, bang, boff, bang, boff. Yes, production, production, production. Same result, same result, same result. We love to be able to do that so that we have a set of input parameters, whatever that may be. It, you might be working uh, in a machinery uh, plant where you have raw materials. You might have sheet aluminium or, or wood or plastic or something coming in at one end. You do something in a machine and out, and you what you produce at the other end is something different from what came out. It's using the raw materials, use a process and you produce something. And for, for an autistic person, someone with Asperger's syndrome, that is great because they know that every seven minutes or every 14 seconds or whatever it is, depending on the nature of that task, you're going to get the same piece of equipment or material coming into your process. You do X and it takes you one minute, 17 seconds or whatever it takes. It might take you 26 minutes. And boom, and outwards and out, you then know that you're going to get exactly the same thing out day, minute in, minute out, hour in, hour out, day in, day out. So that you know what's coming towards you from up the line, you know what you do, and you know what you produce and send down the line. That is something we absolutely love to be able to do because we know what we're doing. We've been told, shown, been able to ask the questions and can do the job. So we have consistency. And you would know. Just by looking up line, that's the wrong thing on the conveyor belt coming towards you. Or it's the wrong way round and it won't go in the machine correctly because it's not configured for the other way round. So you would know straight away. So you'll be able to press your button to stop the conveyor belt, turn it round, press your button to restart, and on you go again. Or whatever the procedure was, if you were receiving something that didn't comply with how you were to get it, you'd have a procedure for that. So... Taking a simple manufacturing situation like that, taking an accountancy situation, we love consistency. We love being able to do the same thing over and over again. Take another example. I used to work as a geologist, as I said earlier, and we would regularly have similar types of jobs. Let's take um, a relatively straightforward example. Let's just suppose your client was a housing developer and they had a plot, they had a site, that they were going to put 50 houses on, there would be certain things that we would do on every single job to look at what was needed for that project. We would start off by making inquiries to the British Geological Survey. We would look to see on the maps, geological maps that we had, whether there was a potential for a mining problem, uh, mining of coal or other minerals. And if it was a coal mining possibility, we would write to the Coal Authority. And when you write to the Coal Authority, you have to send a check with them. If you write to them and say, please invoice me, they won't do anything because they have been burnt too many times by people who don't pay their bill. So that's just something that you know, those in the know know that when you do a coal, coal authority inquiry, you send the check with them. We would look at historical maps to find out what was there. We'd look at geological maps. We'd go and have a look at the site. What's on it? Is there a building on the site? Is there a, is it a chemical works at the moment or is it a green field and there's lovely fields of barley or crops of potatoes on it what's there the historical maps will tell you what used to be there it may have been farmland all its life right back to to days of yore but it might not have been there might have been a river that ran through it there might have been a canal there might have used to have been a mill and all of these things have certain triggers that we would use if we knew that there was used to be chemical works we would look for certain chemical contaminants in the ground we would look for that so we would we would tell the client there's a cost for that so we would go through a process of doing the same types of thing on that site to find out what the nature of the site was so that we could work out what the ground conditions were what we needed to do to establish the, the detail of that. So we would have some trial pits and we would have some boreholes. If we needed to do, if there was potential for mining, we would have to do uh, drilled rotary core holes to, to get core samples to, to look at the quality of the rock. All of those things. So there's a, there's a procedure. There's a way of doing something. And we we're all familiar with that. We all became familiar with that. And so that when we had a job that was, oh, this is similar to the job you had last time. 
last time it worked very well we got good feedback from the client so we want you to do something similar with this so that we would know what we were looking for what was expected of us to deliver so there would be no point saying to us i want you to do something completely different to that last job even though it's virtually the same that just doesn't make sense so we we would be consistent so we would say what well, we did what we did before worked we've checked that it worked we're going to do something similar again with the site specific information that's appropriate to to take the design forward so that's what we would do so consistency of instructions is really important because we would have a mindset we would have a frame of reference that frame of reference was i know what we did on that last job last job i know how long it took me i know what i was looking for i know what the challenges were with that let's have a look see if we have a similar situation here and then you would do your work your investigation your reporting and so on your design calculations whether all sorts of things that you would deal with that looking at the ground conditions for foundations and so on so we would go through a systematic process to come to a to an end product so that when you're working with autistic people excuse me just a moment When you're working with autistic pe person or people and you have done something similar with it, they have done something similar recently within the last three months, six months or a year. And you're going to get them to do something very similar again. Say this is similar to the job you did last April for XYZ client or XYZ project. These are the similar things that we're going to be looking for. That's what I want you to do immediately. Your autistic person, your person with Asperger's syndrome goes right. I know what I'm looking for. I know the sorts of things I'm looking for. I know what is expected of me to deliver to my to my boss. So I know how it all fits together. I know roughly what information I'm going to have at the start. I know what I'm supposed to do with it. And I know what I'm supposed to deliver. So that's your input process output situation that I just explained about the manufacturing plant. So that's really useful to us because we know what we're doing. We absolutely know what we're doing. We're familiar with the process. We're familiar with the type of work. And it's a case of going through the specific steps to get to the end result. So there would be no point in that situation giving completely different instructions to that person. That would be, that would be meaningless. Say, so this is what we had on the previous job. We have, there is just one thing. There's one major thing that is different from what we did before. And it's this so that you've flagged up immediately that there's something different so that they can look so that the person can look at it and, and take it on board when they go through their uh analysis and and producing their, their 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 report or whatever it was that they're doing so consistency is really really important because as i said earlier we like that familiarity we love that familiarity we love that rote of being able to do something again and again and again do it well be told we're doing it well, be told by the boss that they're happy, keep going, you're doing fine, great, well done, so that you know that you're doing the work right every time you're doing it. It's very satisfying when you're doing something like that. One of my part-time jobs I had when I was at school I used to work in a mushroom farm, picking mushrooms. Great, absolutely brilliant, because everything was the same every shed with the mushrooms were was the same size all the beds were the same size the four levels of the beds were at the same height the beds were the same width the mushrooms were the same type there were the the what you had to do to pick the mushrooms was the same the sorting of the mushrooms and the grading of the mushrooms was the same cleaning your bed and your row afterwards was the same moving to the next bed was the same so everything about that job as a mushroom picker was show me let me understand how to do it show me let me do it understand how it's done is that correct yes no ask questions that's it you've got it off you go if you've got any questions as a supervisor will come around from time to time and you ask them or one of the other uh, mushroom pickers that mushroom picking job was fantastic for me because it was once you'd learned what you were doing it was all the same exactly the same no change there was never a change you got a shed you got a bed you picked your mushrooms cleaned it up afterwards you moved on to the next bed 
boom, boom, boom. Input, process, output. The output in that in that circumstances was a tray full of punnets of mushrooms that had been graded and cut and, and all the rest of it. They were getting taken away by a porter to the weighing shed where they would get weighed and wrapped and all the all the other processes that I didn't need to know about. I just needed to know how many mushrooms to put in my punnet, make sure that they were clean, there was no dirt in them, that they were cut at the right angle. All of those things which you learn very quickly on the job at the start because you're shown by your supervisor, this is what you do. Have a go yourself. Yes, you've got the hang of it. Have another go. There's something over there. Go and look at those. Right, when you finished, you clean your bed like this. You had a scraper and you scraped out under the bed so that there wasn't any dirt under the bed because it would get gunky, really gunky under the bed. Simple process. The process of picking mushrooms was great. Exactly the same every time. Brilliant. For someone who had Asperger's like I did, although I didn't know at the time, it was brilliant. I knew exactly what I was doing at every step of the day during my, my time at the mushroom farm. It was fantastic. And if we had really good mushrooms, I would pick like Billio because you, at weekends, you would get a bonus. If you picked a, you had a minimum weight, a minimum amount of mushrooms to pick per day. At about 15% above that, if you picked more than that 15% extra, you would get a bonus. So for every certain quantity of mushrooms above that you picked per day, you would get extra money. So if the mushrooms were really good, you could fly and you would make more money doing exactly the same thing because you knew how it was. So it was input, process, output. Fantastic. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. It was great. But I didn't know at the time I had Asperger's, although I've always known I was different. So that's a simple example, but it, it, it it's valid because it's about being consistent. Consistency of instructions when you're working with people who are autistic or, or have Asperger's syndrome and you're doing something similar to what they have done previously, tell them this is similar to what you did last year back in June when we had that project with such and such a situation. It's similar to that. That's what I want you to look at. But be aware that there might be one or two different things that pop out of your analysis or the project. And boom, just like the accountancy, you get a load of information from the client. You're looking for certain things all of the time to put them into certain spreadsheets so that you can do the analysis and ultimately come up with a, a, a profit and loss statement. Account accountancy is a great field for people who are, who are autistic or Asperger's because it's for once you've been shown and you know how to do it, it's very, very similar. We've got the familiarity. We know what we're doing. There's not going to be any surprises. Some things that it's, it's not going to suddenly change into something completely different because it's accountancy, it's numbers, it's information, it's certain amounts of data in certain categories and certain classifications, and you put them in, and boom, out comes your answer. So consistency of instructions is really, really important for autistic people. It's, it should be important for everyone, and it is important for everyone, but particularly autistic people and those with Asperger's because we love the routine. We love being able to do what we did yesterday because we were told that what we did yesterday went well. Good. Please, what you did today, carry on, keep it up. Boom. Come into work the next day. Bam. Got the same as what I did yesterday. Great. I can get on with it. Be productive. Get my numbers done. Get this amount of work done. Be happy with that because you know what you're doing and you know what is expected of you so that when you pass it on to the next person, next process, or you, you're delivering the end product to your boss, they're going to be able to go, yep, this is great. Andrew's done exactly what we wanted from him. Go go and tell him. Say, thanks, that's really good. Keep it up, well done. And that's something that is part of good leadership. Praise. You must praise your staff. You must reward them. You've got to reward them appropriately in terms of pay rises and bonuses and things of that nature. When someone has done a good piece of work on time to the right standard, to the right frequency, and all of those, it met all of those KPIs, those wonderful thing called KPIs. And if you don't know what a KPI is, I envy you. A KPI is called a key performance indicator. It's basically the mechanics by which you judge someone has done. So take the mushroom farm, for example. If my target was to 
was to pick 150 pounds of mushrooms a day and I picked 84, then if the mushrooms were good, they're going to come up to me and say, Andrew, you only picked 84 pounds of mushrooms today. You should be at 150 minimum. What was up? But if I picked 300 pounds of mushrooms, they go, Andrew, well done, brilliant. Keep at it. Fantastic. You get your bonus for your extra mushrooms in your pay packet next week. So it's really important that you let people know that they've done a good job. We don't need chocolates and flowers all the time. We probably don't get them at all. But to be told by your supervisor, by your boss or their boss, hey, guys, you've, you've worked really well this week, this month, this, this last year. You've done really well. Thanks very much for your efforts. We really appreciate it. The clients are happy with the products that you're producing. That is good leadership because you are telling your staff that you value what they have done. And you will not get a harder worker in an in, in a business than someone who is valued. If you don't value your staff, you're just going to have time served people who are doing their 35 hours, doing their 40 hours. Oh, it's five o'clock Friday. Down tools, go home. But you haven't finished what you were doing. Yeah, well, it's clocking off time, mate. If you value your employees and you make them aware of that, that person might stay back that 10 or 15 minutes on the Friday to finish that thing that needed to be finished rather than go, oh, I'm getting nothing for this. I'm getting berated and chastised and the guy was rude to me last yesterday and he was shouting and bawling at other people. And they're not going to put in that extra 10 or 15 minutes to finish that thing on Friday afternoon. They're going to go, oh, five o'clock, good night, have a good weekend, whatever, I'm going to. If people aren't valued, they're not going to put in that bit extra every now and then to complete something in a certain frame of term time frame, or they won't do it to the right standard. They'll go, yeah, well, a little, that'll do. It's all right. If you value your people, you will get better work from them. Simple, but so often overlooked by micromanagers and people who walk around with clipboards and stopwatches and who are absolutely evil to their employees. And I have worked in those situations in the construction industry. I've worked for some brilliant engineers who inspired me to do wonderful things and to, to want to do better and to better myself and, and produce great work. But I've also worked for some people who really should, shouldn't be anywhere other than a psychiatry ward. They are psychopaths. And they treat their people abominably. That's an aside. I've got off track a little bit. But it's important to reward people, to make sure that people are valued and understand that there's the need to say, that job you did for us last week, we presented it to the client on Tuesday at a meeting. They were chuffed to bits with it. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, for doing that. It's really good. Keep it up. Carry on. Do well. Because... That's how the business thrives. And when the business thrives, it should make more money and you can then pay your staff more when it comes to the annual review. Simple economics of business, but so often overlooked. You've got to reward the people that are doing the work and not just the managers, not just the leaders. So consistency of instructions and consistency of information is really important because as I said, we love familiarity. We love the, the 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 knowing that what we're going to do tomorrow is the same as what we did today, or we're getting something that was we did something similar a few months ago. We love that because we know and understand what it is we're doing. We know what is going to come to us, and in, in whatever it comes, whether it's a production line or a series of information or a report, we do our thing, and we then pass it on down the line for the next person to either take on board and do something else with, or that's the end product that goes to client. Being able to do that, have that familiarity, have that understanding, have the confidence that that gives you because you're doing something that is working. It's correct. It's right. It's valued. You're valued. Boss is happy. Yes. Off you go. Give me some more. I'll do some more. That's what you want. So, the last thing that you want is someone who's continually changing their mind on what they want you to do. Oh, the number of times I have delivered a report to my supervisor, my principal engineer, 
and they've gone, oh, event. They've gone, oh, this isn't what I want. Well, actually, you didn't tell me what you wanted. You just said, there's the job, go do it. Well, there's your answer. If you're not going to tell me what you want and what to look out for, then you're going to get what I, what I think is relevant. So if you don't tell me with clear instructions, no point telling me at the end that that's not what you want. You only knew that that wasn't what you want at the end when I gave it to you. You didn't tell me what you wanted at the beginning. That's no, that's no way to run a shop. Get your clarity of instructions right. Get consistency of instructions right. And that gives the person who's doing the work a chance of getting it right. Because with very, very few exceptions, no one sets out to fail in what they do at work or in life. No one. The only exceptions might be where you've got a disgruntled member of staff who's, for whatever reason, whether it's their fault or the boss's fault or someone else's fault, they've been on disciplinary a couple of times and they've been written up and they've had this happen and that happen. And, and there's a there's a, a an emotional situation with them and their boss or a colleague and they might not put the best effort in. Let's, let's put those to the side for a minute. Normal circumstances, no one sets out to fail. So there's a there's a wonderful phrase in NLP, which goes, the outcome of communication is what you receive. Which basically means, if you don't tell people what you wanted at the beginning, how can they know what to give you at the end? So if you're not making it clear at the beginning, how is someone supposed to know to, to interpret, to reevaluate, to mind read what you wanted? Be clear up front, set the process in place, support the person doing the work, you will then get what you want at the end of it. If you don't set that process up and running, you're just cruising for a failure. You are setting yourself up to fail. And then you're just going to go around and blame the employee. Oh, they didn't do what I wanted. They never did. They never listened to what I'm telling him. Well, actually, because you never tell them properly. You never instruct them properly. You never guide them properly. You never give them clear instructions. Be consistently good at giving instructions. Be consistently good at supporting your staff. And they will be consistently good at delivering what you want. It's not rocket science. None of the things that I have in my seven-step program on how to better manage Asperger's syndrome in the worst place are rocket science. There's virtually no cost. It's all about doing certain things in a certain way with a, within a certain framework that I have, which I adapt to suit your needs of your business. And there's no huge investment. You haven't got to buy five grand's worth of kit and this process, that process. It's me sitting down, talking with you, talking with your teams, instructing your teams in a series of seven steps as to how to better manage people with Asperger's syndrome. Once you've got it up and running, it's repeatable. It's repeatable. It's repeatable. Do you like what I did there? So that's today's topic. That was about consistency. And consistency is absolutely vital. It's a very important cog in the business process. So if you want to know more about managing Asperger's syndrome in the workplace, please feel free to get in touch. You can get me on my website, which is over my shoulder up there, aspergersmatters.com. That's my website. There's a contact form on there, or you can get me on email at andrew at aspergersmatters.com. Keep a lookout for this, the video for this, which will be uh, put up on you, my YouTube channel on Thursday afternoon. And look out on Friday, Friday afternoon or Saturday afternoon for what next week's topic will be about. I haven't decided yet. I need to have a look back and see what, uh, what, what sparks my interest. And if you've got any suggestions for future topics, please feel free to drop me a line and I'll be delighted to consider those for a future topic. So that's me, Andrew Marsh, the resilient Asperger. Please get in touch if you want to know more about doing it managing Asperger's syndrome in the workplace. I'd be delighted to have a free consultation with you for half an hour as to how I can help you and see if there's a fit or if there's just a general question you have. Be delighted to help you out. So that's me, Andrew Marsh. Take care, look after yourselves and let's see if we can do better than we did last week. Take care. <laughs>